welcome everyone. Um, thank you for coming to today's uh, PD. We're going to be talking a little bit about genetics. So <clears throat> today's activity is a an extension of a previous activity. So we're still going to cover the genetics bingo or the trait bing bingo, as I believe it's titled on our site. Um, but we're going to also add an extension activity, and then we're going to give you some intro background information to accompany it, um, kind of book in the activity that already exists. And as you can see, the it, the original activity comes from University of Utah. They have like a whole space where they just develop fun genetics activities. And so I wanted to make sure to give them credit. Um, so I haven't done it yet. So I'll go ahead and introduce myself. So I am Dr. Dominique Brooks uh, with pre-college programs. Um, I'll let my co-presenter introduce himself. Hi, everybody. I'm Stephen Ramsey. Um... I'm a, a faculty member at Oregon State University in computer science and in biomedical sciences. Awesome. And so as I stated, Dr. Ramsey is the one that's going to be starting us off with that good, rich background information to help inform any questions that your students might come up with. And then I will talk about the original activity and then move us into the extension activity um, to, to end the day. So without further ado, I will go ahead and stop sharing and allow Dr. Ramsey to go ahead and take over. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk a little bit about genetics today. Um, I want to uh, start out by uh, thanking uh, Dominique and uh, SMILE and pre-college programs uh, for this uh, uh, opportunity and for all of their great work to help put together the uh, activity for today. And uh, also uh, John McDonald at uh, the University of Delaware. I used uh, quite a bit of his uh, fine website on genetics myths um, in putting today today's putting together today's presentation. So maybe we'll start by talking about what a trait is. So um, the way I think about it is a trait is something that is uh, measurable and it could be either a feature, you know, something physical, uh, or it could be a behavior. Um, but either way, it's of an organism, so an animal, a plant, even a microbe. Um, <clears throat> so, for example, one of a trait for humans. This is one that you probably heard about, and you're maybe in a biology class, or uh, maybe have even talked about it with your students. Is um, uh, earlobe attachment or detachment. So um, it's well known that uh, kids notice that people have differences in terms of how the degree of attachment of their earlobes. So I'll show, I'll take off my headphones to show you mine here. So um, on the left, we have a kind of a more detached earlobe. And then on the right one that it's a little harder to see, but this one is uh, attached all the way almost down to the base of the earlobe here. So <clears throat> um, the, the, the key point that uh, I want to make is that oftentimes in genetics, uh, researchers will use, uh, will draw a distinction between the measurement of a trait for a specific individual, and they might call that a phenotype, versus the trait itself when they're wanting to just talk about um, the thing that's being measured, regardless of uh, what was measured for a specific individual. So trait, and then can be associated with more than one phenotype. I'll also note in passing that a lot of genetics resources use those terms interchangeably. So drawing that distinction between trait and phenotype, it isn't universal, but I think it is helpful to have two different, uh, to be able to refer to them as separate concepts, especially when we get into continuous traits. So that's a good segue into uh, the point that when it comes to human uh, heredity, human genetics, some traits we can kind of think of as approximately discrete. Um, 
So a couple of examples of that might be a uh, handedness, right? So you ask somebody their handedness, you're likely to get one of three answers. Um, left, right, sometimes ambidextrous, can use both equally. Um, sometimes the answer is a little more complex, but for the most part, people fit into one of three bins. Another example of a fairly discrete trait might be tongue curling, right? So some people can roll up their tongues like this, and some people cannot. And there are some people for whom they can kind of a little bit roll their tongues. But there are other, lots of other traits for humans. And this is more the norm, I think, um, where the best way to describe the phenotype is as a number. So these would be the continuous traits. So things like height or weight or uh, uh, resting blood pressure, fasting, circulating cholesterol levels, those sorts of things, all measured with numbers. Either way, it's a trait. Uh, they differ just in how you might encode the phenotype in a survey. So for the discrete ones, it's typically a bin, a category, right? And for these, it would be a number. So in summary, uh, some of these, some traits are heritable, although the amount of heritability can vary by trait. <clears throat> um, so for example, height is well known to be uh, heritable. Um, and genetics, the field of genetics is really the study of trait heritability. So not all traits are heritable, uh, but genetics is concerned with the ones that are to some extent or other heritable. So <clears throat> um, I would be remiss if I didn't um, use uh, Gregor Mendel's pea plants as uh, a useful example. So in the 1800s, uh, Mendel studied pea plants and uh, observed that there was a clear, there was a pattern of connection between the, the flower coloring of plants. And then when he crossed them, the flower coloring of the offspring. And so um, that's a very useful, example uh, to introduce this idea of a binary trait. So with pea plants, uh, the flowers can be purple or white. And so it's customary to using modern terminology to call a trait with two different phenotypes a binary trait. And one of the things that we'll learn later today is that most human traits are not binary. Um, but it's the, the term, knowing the term binary trait is useful to draw a distinction between sort of simple genetics and more complex genetics. So uh, that's why we turn to the pea plant for a good example of a binary trait. <clears throat> so in human genetics, uh, most of what we inherit comes from what you see here. Uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes. So the pairs aren't shown. I've, uh, I don't have all 46 shown here, just one of each type. Um, and I'll, it's worth reviewing a little bit about uh, the human nuclear chromosomes. So just to kind of refresh and make sure we're all on the same page, um, the um, first, 22 chromosomes, so are numbered one through 22. And <clears throat> these are called the autosomes. And they're numbered in this way for a re they're numbered in order of decreasing size, right? So the one is the biggest, then two, then three, and so forth. They look a little jaggedy here because they're centered on the centromere. Um, and, but the size of each of the numbered autosomes should be smaller than the next autosome with the, in the list, than the previous autosome in the list. <clears throat> so one is the, the big heavyweight chromosome down to 22 
which is the smallest in terms of base pair length. Um, and then we have X and Y are the sex chromosomes, right? And uh, XY would be, uh, would develop as a male, XX as female, so forth. So the key point, I guess, for, for you know, for students is that for each of the number of chromosomes, we've got two copies. <clears throat> Within a chromosome, uh, things, if you zoom in a little bit, um, it looks kind of like, kind of like this. This would be uh, how chromatin looks when it's, uh, you zoom in a little bit and you zoom in a little bit more kind of on the thousands to one million base pairs range. We start to see individual regions of the chromosome that get transcribed into messenger RNA and then ultimately proteins uh, for protein coding genes. And so these locations, these loci that get transcribed, those are the genes. <clears throat> of course, today we know it used to be thought that every gene encoded a protein. And we know today that actually there are a lot of genes that don't. Uh, they may, however, encode, encode, encode just RNA molecules that are themselves functional, but that don't make, that don't act as a, serve as a template for uh, translating a protein. So we have genes that encode functional RNAs, and we have genes that encode functional proteins. And sometimes there are genes that do both. And so uh, that's the major change um, in recent years in terms of understanding um, <clears throat> the, you know, kind of the important portions of the genome that uh, govern uh, much of what we see as a, uh, heritable traits. And so the variation that we see from individual to individual is much of that is governed by uh, specific point variations in the nucleotide content of the chromosome. So for example, let's suppose that, uh, we're let's go back to Mendel's pea plants here. <clears throat> and suppose there is a, a difference in the, uh, for the gene that encodes the flower color. Uh, let's suppose there is a difference in uh, that gene. And on one copy of the chromosome, it's got the difference in nucleotide composition that leads to a purple flower. And on the other chromosome, the homologous chromosome, it has at the same position in the same gene, it's got a different nucleotide sequence. And maybe it's only one base different. In some cases, it's more, depending on the trait. Uh, and that difference maybe results in the development of a white flower. Um, <clears throat> so it's customary in genetics to call these two, to distinguish these two different um, kind of codes in the gene as alleles. So we would say this chromosome has the purple flower allele, and this chromosome has the white flower allele. And it's customary as well, in cases where we're talking about a trait, to give an abbreviation for the alleles, right? So maybe for purple flowers, since we'll get, we'll get to this, but since purple is the kind of dominant allele, it's customary to use a capital letter uh, for that abbreviation for the allele. And then correspondingly, uh, it's customary to use a lowercase abbreviation for the recessive allele. So that might be the white flower allele in this case. Um, now you can see, okay, there's some changes have been made to the presentation here. This should say the flowers genotype, my apologies. Um, 
So we would call the combination of the two alleles for the flower for a particular gene, its genotype. And, and so that would be represented with a pair of letters. So um, in this case, since there's one chromosome with the purple flower allele, capital P, and one chromosome with the white flower allele, lowercase p, the genotype would be the combination capital P, lowercase p. It's customary to put the dominant one first. So that's a key point about a genotype is <clears throat> the order of the alleles doesn't matter. So, you know, it doesn't, if, if instead the red chromosome had the purple flower allele and the blue chromosome, the blue chromosome had the white flower allele, the genotype could still be encoded as capital P lowercase p. So it's order independent. So now we have all of, we've kind of got all of the, we've reviewed all of the information to kind of <coughs> formulate a uh, kind of more modern way of defining a classical Mendelian trait. So that's a trait that is binary and it is determined, the phenotype is determined by the combination of two alleles for a single gene. So almost every word of that definition matters, right? So it has to be binary. The phenotype has to be determined by two alleles at a single gene. So one allele for this chromosome and one allele for this chromosome. Anything else, and it's not really a classical Mendelian trait. So that's why the purple and white flower, pea plant flowers are an excellent example. And as we'll learn, it's much harder to find common phenotypes that are Mendelian in humans. So <clears throat> I mentioned previously, it, briefly, that um, one of the, that the purple allele is the dominant allele and the white allele is the recessive allele. And just let's review briefly, so we're all on the same page, um, what that means in practice. So uh, for pea plants, as for people, we have two alleles for the gene. Um, because there are two homologous copies of the chromosome. And so <clears throat> the purple allele is called dominant because if the, if the plant has even just one of the two alleles is purple, capital P, then the flower will be purple. The phenotype will be purple. Same goes if it has two copies of purple, the phenotype is purple. The only way to get um, a white flower, the recessive phenotype, is if both genes have the recessive allele, little p, little p. And th in that case, and only in that case, does the flower, um, does the pea plant have a white flower? So the fancy way of describing, the, the scientific way of describing these three genotypes for the pairs of alleles would be for this case, whoops, excuse me, homozygous dominant, homo meaning same, right? Zygous, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so, right, homozygous, this, pair of alleles, would, we would refer to it as homozygous dominant. We would refer to this as heterozygous. And then this we would refer to as homozygous recessive. There should be an E here, my apologies. So that's a Mendelian trait. So now we're kind of, uh, it's natural to wanna to circle back to human because the exercise today uh, involves talking about and uh, kind of self-assessment for um, human traits and phenotypes. And there are, uh, there are a lot of uh, human traits that are often discussed in introductory genetics curricula. But before we get to human, we'll, we'll, let's review the situation with the pea plant. So in the table here, we've got the first column is a trait, 
And the second column, is it binary or not? So for the pea plant trait, flower color, the, based on the information we have, that's a binary trait. It's either white or purple. Is it heritable? Yes. Is it a single, is it um, the phenotype based on the genotype, the allele combination at a single gene? Yes, it is, the flower color gene. And if all three of these are yes, then per our, def our kind of more modern language definition, this would be a Mendelian trait. So let's go to some of the kind of commonly observed human um, phenotypes that are frequently discussed in genetics curricula. Thumb crossing. So maybe um, <clears throat> you might have read somewhere or been in a biology class where uh, you were asked to clasp your hands together and then record which thumb was on top with the, your right thumb or your left thumb. So in my cases, it's the right thumb. So uh, let's, okay, excuse me. <coughs> um, so let's talk about whether this trait is binary or not. Um, if, you, if you survey a classroom full of students, uh, for the most part, you'll get a uh, one of two answers here. Occasionally, however, though, there might be, um, there are individuals for whom it's not a consistent uh, response, and so it doesn't fit into either category. So we could say, yes, it's mostly a binary trait, but is it heritable? Well, um, based on classical family studies, we know that it is probably, uh, genetics is partially responsible for this. So there is some connection between the parental phenotypes and the phenotypes of the children. But it is, the evidence shows that it is probably not due to a single gene. So this is likely no. So we're gonna say if it, if it fails on this or this, then it's not Mendelian. So thumb crossing is probably not a Mendelian trait. Let's go to another one. So we already mentioned in the um, in the opening part of the presentation, earlobe attachment, that trait. So this one, um, if you survey a class full of students, you're going to see more continuous variation, right? So instead of, uh, <clears throat> there'll be a whole bunch of people for whom it's kind of in between whether the earlobe is in the attached or detached, um, and thus it's not so easy to fit them into binary uh, to unambiguously fit people into one category or the other. Um, evidence from classical family uh, genetic studies indicates that it is possibly uh, partially inherited, um, but it's not as strong as it is for thumb crossing. Uh, and the evidence also indicates that it, to the extent that it is inherited, it is not due to the influence of a single gene. Um, so this would be, the conclusion then would be uh, that earlobe attachment, it, again, is not a Mendelian trait. This is probably a good time to revisit the question of, because a student may ask, well, if a trait isn't entirely genetics. So if the phenotype of the kid is not entirely determined by uh, the classical dice roll, you know, the, the not entirely determined by their genotypes they inherited from their parents, what else, what, what, what is the, um, what does control the development of that phenotype? So of course, environment would be uh, the answer there. Okay, so moving on to cheek dimples. This is a, a kind of a classic human trait. Uh, it's in many of the uh, genetics textbooks and, and molecular biology textbooks as a human trait. Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> it is, however, problematic as an example of a classical genetics trait, um, not least because it isn't binary. It also can be uh, uh, variably expressed. So there are people for whom one on one cheek is a dimple and the other cheek isn't. Kind of unclear what category, how to phenotype that. It can also change over time. Another complication is people sometimes have cheeks, uh, cosmetic procedures that result in a cheek dimple that um, it's not consistent with their, what their genotype might be. So for all those reasons, it is not really a binary trait. Um, and its heritability is uh, at best partial and irregular. So there's some evidence for, for influence of genetics, but it is not complete. Not, um, the heritability is not 100%. <clears throat> you will also find references out there that say that cheek dimple genetics um, is localized to chromosome 16. Um, however, uh, this is, there is, after an extensive review of the literature, I could not find a, 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 a scientific reference to corroborate that claim. So in any event, the evidence suggests that it is probably not single gene. It's, that would mean that it is most likely governed by multiple genes. Therefore, it is not an immutable trait. Moving on, tongue rolling. So we've mentioned that earlier in the presentation. Also not a binary trait because some people are kind of uh, partial tongue rollers. So there's a whole, really it's a continuous continuum of uh, phenotypes. <clears throat> From um, family studies, we know that this trait is only partially inherited with the rest presumably being environment. Um, and the genetics is unknown. So we don't know whether it's uh, uh, what the story is here, but if it is not binary and not fully uh, heritable, then it can't be Mendelian in the classical sense. PTC tasting. Um, so that's that's a interesting trait that is often um, done in genetics lab, like say. Uh, in a college class, uh, sometimes in a high school class, where um, students will get little, be handed out little paper strips that are treated with a, a chemical called phenothiocarbamide that is, um, for some people, extremely bitter tasting. Uh, but curiously, for others, uh, has little taste at all. And so uh, for that reason, it's very popular um, <clears throat> to do an experiment to uh, to phenotype the students in a class about whether they can taste PTC or not, um, and and then to study whether the um, uh, phenotype distribution uh, is consistent with uh, Hardy Weinberg equilibrium and so forth. The um, the problem with PTC tasting as an example uh, genetics trait is that it's not binary. There are people that are intermediate tasters. Its inheritance is, this is when well studied and its inheritance is known to be partial, uh, not uh, entirely uh, governed by genetics. <clears throat> there, it is, however, a, a good example of a trait that is mostly governed by a single gene. Uh, so it's not entirely single gene, but TAS two R thirty eight that human gene is most is it is uh, does dominate the observed variation in the phenotype uh, for people. But therefore, it is not Mendelian. Cleft chin, another example uh, that's often discussed in a genetics curriculum. It's more of a continuous trait with partial inheritance. And it, the evidence suggests that it is, uh, while there is, it is, there is good evidence for partial inheritance, it's probably not due to a single gene. So it's not a Mendelian trait. Freckles, not binary, partial inheritance. And most, uh, the evidence 
indicates that it's two genes or more that govern uh, the phenotype. Thus, it's not a Mendelian trait. Handedness. This one is uh, quite interesting. Um, <clears throat> we've already talked about how handedness, while it can be thought of as a discrete trait, it's really not binary. Uh, it also can change over time. So it's a little tricky to unambiguously phenotype somebody. Um, the trait is known to be partially inherited, but it is polygenic. So we know there are at least four chromas. This has been well studied using modern genomics, uh, genomics techniques. But we know that at least four chromosomes uh, seem to influence the hand of this uh, trait. Arm folding. So when you fold your arms, I, my left arm is on top. For other people, it's the right arm. It's not. Uh, ultimately, it's not a binary trait. Some for some people, it's not consistent. Um, it is um, actually not seen to be really influenced by genetics, uh, and it's not known whether it's a single gene or not. So it's not Mendelian here in this case. Finally, eye color. So this is a, a fascinating trait, uh, also a kind of a staple of genetics curriculum. Important to note though, that it's of course not a binary trait. There's all kinds of different eye colors. Um, it is strongly uh, inherited, um, <clears throat> um, but it is not due, influenced by a single gene. There's uh, this has been well studied using modern genomics techniques, and it's up to 16 genes that influence uh, the uh, phenotype of uh, for eye color. So therefore, it would not be a Mendelian trait. So that just to summarize, um, these are all interesting traits, uh, perhaps with the exception of arm folding. Um, you know, all interesting to discuss in the context of um, human heredity, but probably none of them is a good example of uh, a classical Mendelian trait whose inheritance is governed by, you know, the, the two by two Punnett square. The reason for that is, you know, imagine if you, uh, one reason is imagine if you present a trait, say earlobe attachment, as an example of simple inheritance, and suppose a student in the class who has the dominant phenotype, but both of whose parents have the recessive phenotype. Now, this is entirely possible for most of those traits we just discussed. But if the trait is presented as simple inheritance, the student may jump to an incorrect conclusion, right? Or be very confused or feel that something is wrong with them. Um, Another point uh, that's related to this is that uh, sometimes in high school classes they'll, or in college classes, there will be self-study uh, using accurate, scientifically accurate genetic markers, things like blood type and so forth. Uh, and those are great. They're certainly more scientific than using uh, a, a, one of the phenotypes like tongue rolling. Um, but they're really, they can lead to conclusions that are really not the sort of thing that we would want necessarily to reveal in the classroom. So that's something to bear in mind, especially for students that are uh, at the, uh, where that would be in a sort of uh, age appropriate. Um, and a good alternative to using human traits to discuss classical Mendelian inheritance would be uh, cat fur coloration. So there's lots of, there's a bunch of good examples of cat traits that are um, more closely uh, Mendelian. And so a good place to look uh, for information about that would be the University of Delaware, uh, John McDonald's website at the University of Delaware. So with that, uh, that was um, kind of the lead in to today's activity, which is to um, present a genetics bingo. Go ahead and stop the share so uh, Dominique can jump in. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, I feel like every time we talk, 
I start generating more activities for us to do in the future. Uh, but yeah, we could definitely talk about that. Offline. So I'm, I'm in. <laughs> Sounds great. All right. Let me go back to sharing my screen. Move this window out of the way. All right. And so we're going to get into the activity a little bit right now. Um, so these slides will be made available to you along with the video um, on our website, precollege.oregonstate.edu. And I'll remind you at the end, but this is also information about where um, this particular activity came from. Because again, they have a wealth of information on that site. Um, I kind of got lost in it. And so I think that a lot of folks will find it useful. All right, so as previously mentioned, when I've discussed this activity before in our summer teacher workshop. Um, so we've already kind of done the intro and lead in. Um, that was the background discussion that uh, Steve just wrapped up. We're gonna talk about how to set up and play this version of Bingo um, and some follow-up ideas, including um, an extension. So in terms of what I feel, I'm gonna move some things around so that I can actually see what I'm reading. That's probably important. All right, so what I feel, and just in terms of getting students to a point where they can really uh, dive into the activity is focusing on what are traits, <laughs> what are genes, where do they come from, maybe go over that table uh, that, that Steve talked about earlier, but just making sure that students are clear on those, those things. Um, and then also talking about um, heredity, which I'll touch a little bit more on that a little later, because that'll come in handy for the extension activity. All right, so bingo, setup and gameplay. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to pull out anything extra fancy to add to bingo in terms of how to play and how to win. It's generally the same. All right. So in terms of incorporating some additional creativity and free choice in your classroom, allowing students to create and set up their own bingo board can uh, help with that. Um, also, if you've done things in your class, like I know for Smile, at some point there was an activity where we sent out the PTC tasting strips that Steve talked about. Um, and so you can incorporate that into the bingo board if you'd like. Um, but the first thing is you wanna create sort of where everything is coming from, right? So uh, if you want students to, I guess, really get into it, allow them to come up with different traits, maybe different family members, um, relationships, so mother, father, cousin, aunt, uncle, in addition to um, some of those more popular traits that we talked about. Um, and the point of this is if you look at the complete activity, and I'm actually going to stop sharing. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to start a new share. How about that? All right. Zoom is not cooperating today, so I will describe <laughs> what I am trying to share. So um, the good folks over at Utah um, made worksheets to go along with the bingo sheets that um, kind of give props for how to lead students to checking off the square. So one of the questions um, is along the lines of cross off any relative that you don't inherit traits from. And so that's where putting in those relationships would come in handy and could potentially generate more conversation. I'm gonna flip this back to the top. Um, so once you've generated that trait bank and relationship bank or wherever you want students to look to pull into their bingo sheet, let them have at it. Um, they can use words, pictures, um, however you infuse creativity into your classroom, go for it. All right, so step two, gameplay. Um, again, pretty straightforward. Uh, 
all the traditional ways you can win bingo. You can get fancy with it. Um, I've seen some boxed bingo where you just, any, the outside borders, um, of course there's four corners and then the diagonals and straights, um, but make, making sure that everybody's on the same page um, about bingo. All right, so what I've just gone through is sort of the initial um, original setup for bingo. And so now we're gonna talk about the extension activity that'll pull in again, some of that information uh, that Steve shared with us um, about heritability, et cetera. Um, and so one of the extension activities is called inherited or learned, right? So you can create a trait bank using inherited and learned behaviors. You don't necessarily have to identify which are which in the trait bank, but just making sure that students really understand the difference between something that's inherited and something that's learned. Now, it can get a little tricky because as Steve discussed, there are partially inherited traits that can also be impacted by the environment or enhanced through learning. Um, and so for this activity, um, we'll say that even if it's only partially inherited, it counts as inherited. So a learned or acquired behavior or trait will be something that is exclusively learned or acquired. So one of the ways you can, I guess, challenge your students is if they call bingo, as they're calling off the squares, they will have to identify whether or not what they're calling off is an inherited trait or a learned or acquired trait or behavior. Um, another way is they can mark off five um, squares anywhere on the bingo board, but they have to all be in the same category, right? So if they mark off five, they all would have to be inherited traits. And so as they're reading them off, they'll have to say that they're all inherited or same thing for learned, right? So whether they're in a row or in that four corners plus the center, um, set up, or if they're just scattered across, if they get five, all in the same category, that counts as bingo, but they have to prove it. Another potential extension activity that I kind of slid down to the possible homework assignment category is thinking of a trait that your students have. So tell your students, think of a trait that they have, like maybe it's something that they're really proud of or uh, something that they feel like is unique to them, um, something that they have that, I don't know, somebody they really admire has, um, but focus on that trait, have them do some research, whatever that means for them, about whether it was inherited or learned, and then talking about how they know, right? And so I think that that would be a good way to kind of extend it beyond the classroom. So those are some quick extension activities and explanations. Um, again, if there's any confusion, feel free to drop any questions in the chat. Um, trying to keep an eye on that a little bit. But we also have more fun genetics activities. So as I mentioned before, every time I uh, get with Steve, it feels like we're working on the activity at hand, but then also somehow end up planning <laughs> for the next time we get together. Um, and We've captured uh, what we've done together in addition to some things that have happened um, with other uh, faculty members at Oregon State. Um, so whether it's taking the activities and playing them outside of the classroom, um, switching up how you answer. So you wanna answer based on maybe the person sitting next to you, or I'm gonna answer for my dad. Um, and so I'm playing bingo as if I'm responding um, responding for my for my dad, um, et cetera. All these kinds of ways can help extend the bingo game. Um, but in addition to that, we have additional activities. Um, and so those are at the site that I mentioned as well, um, which is also listed in the PowerPoint. And again, this will all be included, um, but SpongeBob genetic and, genetics and alien genetics um, are two activities that Steve and I um, have co-developed for uh, elementary school and then there are also some for the middle school. Um, so if you wanna kick it up a notch, um, try to peek at those and see if any of those are interesting to you. 
So that wraps up um, the background information and uh, the actual gameplay for us. So a huge thank you um, on behalf of pre-college programs for the audience out there uh, taking the time to view this video and then the audience who currently with us. Um, and also a huge thank you to our collaborator, Dr. Stephen Ramsey. Um, literally could not have done this without you. <laughs> uh, any questions or comments that you have, feel free to contact smileprogram at oregonstate.edu. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing really quickly because I see there's some activity in the chat. All right, well, if that's all we have, um, in terms of questions and comments, then we can go ahead and wrap up there. Again, I want to thank everyone for participating um, out there. I'm just gonna assume that at some point, if you watch the video, you're gonna participate. Um, and definitely, again, I wanna, I wanna thank uh, Dr. Stephen Ramsey. So with that, I will bid you adieu and thank you for attending um, Oregon State's uh, Smile Professional Development. Uh, yeah, I'm Dr. Dominique Brooks with Pre-College Programs, and uh, yeah, hope hope to see you at, at a future PD. Thank you. Thank you.